Hello everyone, my name is Sam Spade and welcome to another Coding Fundamentals and GML tutorial. And this is part two of recursion. So as we said in part one, recursion is a method of solving a problem where the solution depends upon solutions to smaller instances of that same problem. And the great thing about recursion, why it's so useful, is that it allows you to solve some really complex and important problems easily. And the reason it allows you to solve these problems easily is because you get to break the problem down. So if you can figure out or build an intuition for what is the small version of the problem, and then you solve that problem, and then you find a way to recursively go through that problem, solving it over and over again until you have the whole solution, it does in fact make solving some of these problems very easy. The hard part is figuring out what that problem is, how you solve that problem, what's the base case, and so on. And building an intuition for that is really key, I think, to understanding how recursion works and using it yourself for real problems. So the basics of recursion, like we talked about last time, is having a base case, which allows the function to terminate instead of going on forever. The function will generally call itself, passing along a smaller version of whatever information it received. And then I want to add one more idea to consider, which is that for each recursive function call, you're trying to figure out what action needs to be taken in that, that instance of the call. So there's an ad that plays where I live uh, that ends with, if you don't see my dad, see another dentist. And here you have a recursive function call. You have the base case, the dentist is her dad. And if the dentist is her dad, you stop. Otherwise, you see another dentist. And that's the action, the recursive function call that you're taking. So you can think of it like there's a bunch of dentists. And you pick a dentist. Is that dentist her dad? No. Pick a dentist. Is that dentist her dad? No. Pick a dentist. And you just keep going until you finally pick the dentist that is her dad. Now that's sort of a silly example, but we can actually do this in code, and we will uh, when we switch over to Game Maker Studio 2. But I want to talk about one slightly more real-world example, pathfinding. Recursive function calls are often used for pathfinding, which is something that you really want in many games. So I can demonstrate it here. Let's say this is our very simple maze. We're going to have the robot start here. There we go. What the robot wants to do is move right. If they can't move right, they want to move down. If they can't move down, they want to move left can't move left, they want to move up. And if none of those places are new, they want to backtrack. And the base case is that they've reached the end. So we have our base case, reach end. We have our action, which is go a different direction, either uh, left, down, right, or up. And if you can't, backtrack. And that's pretty straightforward. But following those basic rules, this robot can make it through the maze. So can the robot go left? Yes. Left? Yes. Left? Yes. Down? No, right, that's backtracking. Just assume that when I say left, down, right, up, backtracking is not included. So no, up, no, so we backtrack. Left, no, up, no, backtrack. Down, yes, down, yes. Actually, that should have been a right, yes, then down, left. Then can they go right? Yes, can they go right? And they've succeeded and made it to the end. And so this is a much more real world example where we have a complicated problem getting through a maze or getting an AI through a maze. But the solution to that problem turns out to be very simple. It's just a basic set of actions. Go right, then down, then left, then up. And if none of those are possible, backtrack until you reach the end. And this, I think, brings up another point for why recursion sometimes is often hard. The basics of recursion, actually, as we've talked about, are very simple. But you often use recursion to solve quite complicated problems, such as pathfinding. And it's important to keep that in mind, is that often what makes recursion hard is not actually the recursive part of recursion. What makes recursion hard is the fact that we're using it to try to solve a complicated problem. The good news is that many recursive problems have already been solved in many other languages, sometimes even in GameMaker, and so you can find example code to work through it. So let's switch over to GameMaker Studio 2 and see a couple examples. All right, so before we started, I want to go through the object. Our object has three events. So in our create event, we're going to have code for our first set of uh, recursive functions, um, which we'll just run through in the debugger in a moment. And then we're going to have code for our second set of recursive functions, which is going to be a flood fill. And we're going to have some keyboard checks so we can both restart and actually do the flood fill. And then we have some code right here to simply draw the grid to the screen. And I'm just looping through it. Uh, with a double for loop and then checking the value stored in the grid where zero will be white one will be black and two will be red and then using those coordinates to draw a rectangle to the screen with that color but 
let's go through the first code here, or the first set of recursive functions. Okay, so we have our array, which we're gonna create using the array literal. You can see over here, two, one, four, five. Now, we're gonna use this function, array find index, to see whether the value one is in our array. It is, we can see that it is right here. So, zero, one, this function should return the value one. We step in, and now we're gonna call our recursive function call. In our recursive function call, what we're doing is we're passing in the array, we're passing in the value that we're looking for, and then we're passing in the position that we want to check. So to start with, we're going to check at the length of the array minus one, which in an array of four, length array minus one will be three, so we're starting at the end of the array. And now, uh, let's go into that. So here is our actual recursive function. So we're renaming the arguments, just so it's a little bit easier to use. So the first thing we wanna do is see if our position is less than zero. This is one of our base cases. If it is, that means we've looped through the whole array and haven't found the value, so we're gonna return negative one. The next thing we wanna do is see whether the array at the position we're at is equal to the value. This would mean that we had found the value in the array and we can return that position. So right now, our position is three. We can see three here is five. So is our value one equal to five? No, we're gonna skip over that. Now we're gonna do another recursive function call. But remember from our first video on recursion that we're gonna pass in a slightly smaller version of ourself. So our current position minus one. In other words, we're moving up the chain. Also notice over here that as we step in, another layer is gonna be added to the call stack. Same code, go through. Position is not less than zero yet. The values don't match come in again, and now our position is one, still not less than zero, but array position one is one, those values will equal. So we will simply return position, and now we're gonna come up all the way through the stack, we're done, we'll return here, and we finished. Our value is equal to one, which is what we expect. We found that at value one. Now I'm gonna go through it again, a little bit faster, but we're searching for a value that is not actually in the array. So we are searching for value 101, and uh, value 101 is not in this array. So we go through, we're going in again, we're going in again, our position is one, so we're checking here now, we're going in again, our position is zero, you can see that here. We're going in one more time, now our position is negative one, negative one is less than zero, so we're gonna return negative one. And of course this makes sense because if we checked, array at negative one, we're gonna get an error. So we want that base case to stop us from getting an error. So we return negative one, that return goes all the way up. So each function is returning negative one to the function before it, returning negative one to the function before it till we get all the way back up here, which returns negative one to this function, which returns negative one to value, and there we go. So one thing I wanna talk about, is you may have noticed in our recursive scripts, See, where did I put it? We had, we were looking at this script right here, array find index recursive. This is the script that we were going through that's recursive. Now, this is a very simple, almost silly example because we could have simply done this in a loop. We could easily loop through the whole array and see if we found that value in the array. So we'd start at zero, we'd go until we reach the array length, and then we just check whether or not array at i equal the value, if so, return i. If we made it all the way through, we just return negative one. So I could just as easily comment this line out, comment this line in, and it would work just fine. We'd get the exact same results. And this is, I think, a point worth mentioning. Pretty much everything that you do recursively, maybe even everything for all that I know, can be done iteratively. But whether or not you want to use a recursive solution or an iterative solution often depends upon the type of problem that you have. Here, I actually think the iterative solution would be much cleaner and I would use it. In fact, I wouldn't even have this wrapper script. The reason I have this array find index wrapper script is so I can choose which version I wanna use for example purposes. If I were doing it for real, I just put the for loop in this script and that would be this script. But there are certain things that are much easier to do with recursion than they would be to do iteratively. And that's gonna be our next example. So before I walk through the code, I'm gonna show you what it looks like in practice. 
So I've created a grid and I've started by filling in at random some spaces. White is going to stand for empty. This is going to stand for full. And when I push spacebar, we're going to flood fill all of the empty spaces starting from this corner. So note that there's no way to get here orthogonally, so it's going to stay blocked off. I can regenerate it, flood fill, regenerate it, flood fill, regenerate it, flood fill. Note that this whole section is locked off, so it doesn't get filled in. Regenerate it, flood fill. That's the only space that gets filled in here. Regenerate it. So I can just do this. And this is a solution that I'm doing recursively. So now let's walk through this in the code and see how it works. So I'm just going to comment this out. Come down here. We have our grid size of 100. Uh, then we're getting our grid width and height just by taking room width and height and dividing it by grid size. We're creating our grid and then we're simply looping through that grid to start with and with a double for loop and we're setting that position to either zero or one and we're giving it a slightly greater chance to be empty uh, than full. Again, remember that our draw code checks the value in the grid and sets its color based upon whether it is zero, one, or two, where zero is white, one is black, two is red. Then I always wanna make sure that the top left is set to zero so that the flood fill will work correctly. So I just set that top left to zero. Now, whenever I push R, we restart, but if I push space, we start our flood fill with zero, zero. And here is our flood fill function. And notice that this is it. This is all of the code to do that whole flood fill. It is just one function call that calls itself over and over and over again. Very simple. If you wanted to do an iterative solution to this, it would be much more complicated. So let's walk through this function uh, before we run through it in the debugger. We have our base cases. We're checking whether or not the values that are passed in for X and Y or column and row are less than zero or greater than or equal to the grid width and height, which would mean that the coordinates were out of bounds. We're also checking to make sure that our position in the grid is empty, or in other words, if it is not empty, we're stopping the function. Then we have found a valid and empty position in the grid. We're gonna set it to red or two. And now we call this same function four times for up, left, right, and down. We have left and right, up and down. So let's run this. Okay, so here's our grid, and we're not going to step through all of this because it would be dozens, if not hundreds, of function calls. But we're going to push spacebar. Here we are. Step in. So here we go. First value is 0, 0. That's going to be a valid position. It is going to be empty, so we're going to make it past these base cases. Switch the resource view so you can see it. And now let's just start stepping in. So we go in. We've got a flood fill. Is this one valid? No. So that one was valid. We got another one. This one goes in. You can see that we're popping in a bunch of flood fills. We're just keep, we keep going in. So this is, let's see, this is to the left. So if we bring up our grid, we're going left. So we're saying, do this one, valid, this one, valid, this one, valid. I think this is gonna be the one that is not valid. Let's find out. Yeah, and so there we go. Now you can see we're on line 18, which means we're going right. And so you could work this out on paper, but you can see that we've gotten this one, this one, this one, this one, and now this one can't go this way. So it's actually checking back here, but this one has been filled in. We can't see it being filled in because the draw event hasn't updated, but this one has been filled in. So this one will pop off, should see it, go through. Yep, so now we're on 1719. That means it's checking, what is that up? This one's gonna be invalid because we are at the top row. Now we should see it. Oh wait, sorry, no, plus one will be down. So this one will be valid. So now we've gone here and now we're going left again. Eventually we'll hit here, we'll stop and we'll probably go up and then I think over there. Now this you might recognize as a depth first search as opposed to a breadth first search, which would fill in sort of like from here in a circle expanding out, whereas this is gonna go probably like this and then like this and then like this and go as deep down these paths as it can before it finally comes back up here and goes down around like that. And if you want, you can download the source code and step through this maybe on a smaller scale to see how it works. But there we go. That's the flood fill recursive code in action. So in summary, recursion is a method of solving problems most commonly used when a function calls itself. You wanna have a base case 
can generally pass along some smaller version of itself to that problem. And it is very useful for solving certain types of complex problems, which unfortunately is also what makes it a little bit harder, not just that it's recursive, but that we're using it on a complex issue. But even so, it's very useful and worth practicing and thinking about so you can develop an intuition for how to use it yourself. I think it helps to learn from a couple different sources. So here are some other videos that might be worth looking at for different ways to think about recursion or different uh, examples of recursion. And the slides and source code, of course, will be linked below as well. And that's it. Thanks for watching.